Hey folks, we are back on livecoding.ca. I am hanging out with Luca, who is just fixing his microphone, I think. Um, we are here today to hang out with Luca. Uh, you're the creator of Fresh, is that right? Okay, cool, cool. That's right. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, yeah, just go ahead, let us know a little bit about yourself, and then we'll just kind of dive into it. Yeah, so I'm Luca. I work on the Dino project um, full time. I work at the Dino company and we build um, the Dino CLI and uh, a uh, hosting product called Dino Deploy, which a couple other companies also build on and you can use yourself. It's like an edge runtime. Um, and I also build Fresh, which is a full stack web framework for Dino, um, which tries to be modern and I don't know, I'm sure we'll get more into exactly what it is in a minute. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Cool, cool. Yeah, no, th uh, thanks for coming on. I'm sure you got a lot on the go. Um, yeah, speaking of yeah, Dino, yeah, we actually, I, I work in Netlify and we use it for our edge offering. So uh, if folks are kind of wondering if it's production ready, I would definitely say yes. Um, so uh, we're definitely going to talk about Fresh, which is a new web framework, but I kind of want to touch on Dino a bit first because I'm... I'm somewhat familiar with it, but I know Dino might be something that's new to a lot of folks. So I guess, I guess high level, like what is Dino? Yeah. So Dino's original pitch is that Ryan, the person who originally created, created Node, um, went like 10 years later or eight years later or so, looked back yeah. at Node and tried to reflect on everything that went wrong with Node and tried to fix everything that was wrong with Node. What came out of that is Dino. And Dino tries to be like a JavaScript runtime but also a TypeScript runtime because that's very popular at this point to have TypeScript yeah. built in. It's much more fully integrated, like batteries included, like other modern languages like Rust and Go, where they have like formatters and linters and testing frameworks, benchmarking, uh, dependency management, all that built in into the, mm -hmm. like as, as one integrated system. And we try to be really modern with the JavaScript that we use. Um, so we try to really make full use of ES6 and all of the cool stuff we've gotten from that promises async iterators, web APIs, like readable stream, writable stream. We try to just stick really closely to the browser. So like have fetch for HTTP server rather than having custom APIs. And we have uh, module resolution works the same way that it does in the browser. So we like import stuff from URLs and you can use import maps just okay. like in browsers to, to remap specifiers, stuff like that. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, I find the project pretty interesting because like, uh, I, I dropped a link to that talk about uh, 10 things I regret about Node.js. And I, I can't remember when Ryan started working on it. I think it was like three, maybe four years ago. Uh, I'm not positive, but... I think May 20, on May 23rd, it was four years ago. So it's okay. been like four and a bit years now. Okay, yeah. Quite a yeah, while. No, and, <laughs> yeah, no, I remember I, I found the talk really interesting because like he was critical of a lot of things of Node, but I think he, if anybody is allowed to be critical about it, it's probably the creator of it. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, no, I've, I, I'm a big fan of TypeScript, so I found it interesting that he decided to go with TypeScript. And I know just, just from what I'd read like a few years ago, it was initially uh, coded in Go, I believe. And then... I'm not sure when, but there was a, a pivot to go to Rust, I believe, but I, I, I don't know what, I mean, I know Rust is a very great language. So do you know what the reason for the pivot was? Yeah, I do. Go is a garbage collected memory managed language like JavaScript or C Sharp, where yeah. the runtime itself can do things like garbage collection. It can do cycle detection. It can do reference handling of, of objects. You don't need to manually mem manage memory pointers, stuff like that. And if you're trying to build a, like V8 JavaScript is also very, very memory managed language, right? And V8, yeah. the engine that we use to run JavaScript, the same one that's used in Chrome, has a very advanced garbage collector and Go has a very okay. advanced garbage collector. And if you have two of these very advanced garbage collectors in the same binary uh, and they're trying to like in the same process in the same thread and they're co continuously fighting with each other when they're trying to garbage collect they have like two separate heap pools it becomes like a nightmare pretty quickly so what you you really don't yeah. want to have your host language for your javascript runtime be garbage collected language and rust okay. at that point and i think it still is is by far the best manually memory managing like the the, the best language to manually where you can do manual mem manual memory management <laughs> like it's safe yeah it's really fast okay. yeah no there's a lot of stuff uh, i'm still pretty new to rust but i i've been learning a bit of it last uh, last year last fall and 
uh, I definitely, there's some con. well, I definitely love the pattern matching in it, but I, I definitely, there's some concepts like, you know, the, the borrowing and all that. It's, it's an interesting, it's, it takes a second to get your head wrapped around it, but it's yes. kind of neat yeah. how only one thing can ever own the data, which in theory, and I imagine in practice too, means you can never have any kind of, uh, data collisions or issues with concurrency, or at least that's, that's like the big thing, isn't it? Yeah, so the, the core principle of Rust is that you can never have two references to the same bit of mutable data. Or sorry, no, you can never have two mutable references to the same bit of data. Like you can have multiple references to the same data. If you all can only read from the data, that's fine. But yeah. if you want to modify the data, you have to be you have to have like single ownership over that data at that point in time when you're trying to mutate it, which allows you to make sure that when you're mutating this data other like threads, for example, can't be in the middle of reading that data. You can't break them because you're out of sync from them. So that's, and the, the entire borrow checker and Rust's memory ownership model is built around the concept that you can only ever have a single mutable reference to some bit of data. And it like takes a while to wrap your head around, but like once you do, it's, it's very empowering because it allows you to, um, to, to build like really fast software and really yeah. safe software with very little effort. Well, I say very little effort, very little effort compared to something like C++, right? Where you have to continuously yeah. keep your mind in the space. Like, is this safe? Um, where do, like, do I need to move this pointer? Like crazy stuff mm -hmm. that you don't need to deal with in Rust. Because the compiler yeah. will just error if you do something wrong. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I know even like the, the Chrome team has started to build out parts of the V8 engine with it because because of like as far as i know the majority of it's written in c plus plus and there's like mm -hmm. i don't know how many bugs but there's definitely bugs related to memory management and they've been slowly plugging in rust there as well to uh to help um uh kind of squash some of those bugs um and it, it yeah. definitely makes sense what you're saying about the garbage collection because i used to do c sharp quite a bit and, it, and it's nice when you don't have to worry about you know allocating and deallocating memory but I can definitely, there is a hit to having the garbage collector, you know, at some point, you know, not that your program seizes up, but there's, there's at one point, you know, like somebody has got to take out the trash, you know, and, and I, yeah. and it definitely makes sense what you're saying. If the two languages are garbage collected, then I, I could see that being an issue. Yeah. They're, they're continually fighting with each other. Like they're not coordinating on when they're going to do these pauses uh, okay. to do garbage collection. So they, they yeah. might happen half a second apart from each other, which is probably fine, but like they might also just happen right after each other. And then you have like a lockup of 200 milliseconds in your program where they're both yeah. doing garbage collection. And I guess, I guess another reason I could think of why the move to Rust might have happened too is WebAssembly, I imagine as well. Cause like, uh, like I know WebAssembly started off with Rust. I mean, you can do other things now. Like there's like .NET projects like Blazor where you can write C sharp to compile to, to Wasm and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, but all the stuff I saw initially and, and it has been a lot of stuff has just been in Rust for Wasm. So I imagine that pairs nicely given that Dino's a, a JavaScript runtime serving stuff on the edge. Uh, and, you know, so it seems like it would yeah. pair well. I think we like originally when the switch was made, this was not really something we considered at all. But over okay. time, this is really like proven to be insanely useful. Like a lot of our internal infrastructure that's built it's for native code in in the binary in the CLI binary, we also have Wasm builds for it that you can just run on the oh, edge okay. um, in Wasm containers. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And then uh, so and then yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get to fresh uh, shortly. But uh, and obviously, uh, TypeScript seemed to make sense because well, one, it's definitely rising in popularity. It's it's. Uh, People might not realize this, but TypeScript's been around since 2012. Like, because I, I started using TypeScript, I used to work in a Microsoft shop, so uh, I was using it back in 2015. When it it's definitely changed a lot. Uh, it's definitely way better now. But, but um, it, you know, I guess if you've never worked with a type language, it, it, I I know it it trips people up sometimes because you know like. When you're writing stuff in JavaScript, you can coerce things or you can just be like, yeah, okay, I know it's not exactly the same thing, but I can add this property later or whatever. But uh, it's kind of nice that it adds that to the language natively, uh, I find, because you do get those those type checkings in place. But uh, but you can also write plain JavaScript as well, right, in, in yeah. Dino? 
Okay. Yeah, TypeScript's completely opt-in. Um, we do recommend you use it because it's just, it's a much better experience really. Um, like the learning curve from switching from JavaScript to TypeScript is much lower than, I don't know, switching from JavaScript to Rust, for example, right? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And the amount of benefit it provides, it's like even if it didn't do type checking, even just for like editor completions is just so phenomenal. It's just worth it just alone for editor completions. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, yeah, no, I, I've been digging into Dino a bit lately. One, because we're going to be talking about Fresh, but also just at work where, like I said, we were we use it for our Edge offering. And and I know right now it, it integrates pretty well. I don't know about other editors, but it integrates pretty well with VS Code. There's a, a Dino mm -hmm. land extension. So then you can, uh, you can set up some uh, settings so that you get like the linting or the formatting and... Uh, and also, I guess it, it takes over from where the normal TypeScript language server runs because I, I remember when I didn't have those Dino settings enabled, it's like you would all of a sudden get all these type errors because it couldn't find yeah. the URL imports, I think. It, it seems like a, a lot of thoughts gone into a, a lot of things. I know it's 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 definitely a, a a big endeavor, I would say, to create a new runtime. So it's it's pretty cool to see it like yeah. be production ready at this point. And it's like the, the, the big thing is, is that it's not just uh, it's not just a runtime, right? Like it's a whole battery included tool chain. And part of that is this yeah. like language server, which powers the extensions and the formatter and things. So like um, you can sort of compare this to Node as like, oh, it's a competitor to Node. But no, it's not really. It's a competitor to Node plus Prettier plus plus yeah. like the built-in TSD support in, in, in VS Code plus ESLint plus ES build plus like X other things, right? Like we're essentially yeah. consolidating the entire JavaScript uh, ecosystem into a single binary, like a bunch of tooling at least. Yeah, no, I, I personally, that doesn't bother me. Like I know people have opinions about, you know, like I, I want to format my things this way. And it's like, I'm more of the opinion, like, like even prettier when it formats sometimes, I don't like the way it looks, but honestly, mm -hmm. I have... I have so many other things to care about than that, you know, yeah. and, and so it's like, you know, it's opinionated, but it's already set up. So I'm just like, I'm cool with that. I can just actually work now and I can just know it's going to format or lint or whatever. So yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's interesting. It's, A lot of t tools have been going in that direction, I think too. Yeah. I, I think it's something that Go originally proved how well it works. Like, the, the the idea where you like opinionate everything and you provide very little customizability and you provide like one proper way of doing everything rather than like three half baked ways of doing stuff and yeah. a little bunch of configuration to tweak it to how you like it like if if there's a single good way of doing it even if it's not the perfect way of doing it it's just so much easier to use than than like every project you go in and you have to like configure everything yourself to to your liking it's just not no, worth it yeah and uh yeah no and i was uh, we'll just wrap up a little bit on some of the Dino here, but uh, like you said, it's not just to serve web pages on on the edge or anything. Uh, it's you can build CLIs with it. Uh, I think I was I ran Dino Compile a couple days ago, so you can actually just generate a single binary, which is kind of nice too if you want to yeah. have a tool. So that's cool too, and and I I think that's compelling too because like these are web technologies. You know what I mean? Like people are probably at this point, probably at least familiar with TypeScript, but if not, you know, JavaScript still and stuff. So uh, I think that's cool too. I did have some questions like, so I, I didn't realize this initially until I, I had read a bit more about Dino, but Dino under the hood is actually running off of the V8 isolate. It's actually running JavaScript at the end of the day. And I was kind of curious, you know, so like there's the TypeScript layer and for folks who've been doing TypeScript for a while or any kind of modern front end web development, you typically have a bundle step, you know, and that's usually transpile or compile, however you want to call it, uh, the mm -hmm. TypeScript to the JavaScript. And I'm curious because I know Dino has some really great performance. So I'm, I'm curious how that compares to like just raw JavaScript if they both end up running in V8 at the end of the day like like how do how do they get that performance boost by even adding this extra layer of not necessarily complexity but like a potential build step I guess yeah I don't know best way to say it yeah, yeah I, I get the question so the so do you know under the hood at the end of the day runs JavaScript using V8. And V8 runs that JavaScript by compiling it to bytecode, and then that bytecode gets turned to machine code, and that like runs on your CPU as CPU instructions. So it's like yeah. just essentially your your runtime is always just a layer, like a, a bunch of layers glued together, which 
like transpile okay. your source code down to lower and lower layers until at some point the CPU can understand it, right? And yeah. do you know adds like one extra layer on top of V8, which is our I don't know what we call it. We call it, well, we, internally we call it Dino emit. It's like what okay. emits your TypeScript to JavaScript. And what we do is just in time, just before we run the TypeScript or just before we run the sort your source code, we'll strip out all yeah. the types and we'll cache that emit output onto disk. So then okay. if you execute it next time, we won't even have to do the transpiling. This is just an optimization. And also yeah. we do not transpile TypeScript using the TypeScript compiler, but we have uh, SWC, it's a... A transpiler written in Rust, which yeah. can do the transpilation in Rust. And it's like orders of magnitude, like two, three orders of magnitude faster than TSC at, at transpiling TypeScript at the cost of not being able to do type checking. So we cannot do type checking at this stage. We, we have to do types. We do type checking separately. So there's a Dino check yeah. command that you can run and that'll do type checking. But when you're just executing, we'll essentially just strip out all the types and, and pipe the source code into V8. Okay. Gotcha. And I, I guess that's, I, I would think that's an okay trade-off to not do the type checking because typically if you're building an app or you know your code base, you're, you're probably going to have type checking in your editor when you're working and you probably have either a pre-commit or like a, you know, once a pull request yeah, is, you yeah. know, going to get, you know, you know, handle it there. And at, at that point, Honestly, if type checking fails after the type checking pass there, then something is probably wrong. But so I think yeah. that, that makes complete sense to, to completely bypass and just strip the types at that point. And, and we, what we do support is like, so that's essentially what we, 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 what we expect people to do is um, use the type checking that's built into the editor, or actually it's not built into the editor, it's provided to the editor using Dino LSP, our language server, through like the Dino extension and do type checking in during development that way. And then if they don't use an editor which supports this or they don't like this sort of thing, they can do Dino check dash dash watch. And then it'll just like continually type check as files change and they'll get diagnostics okay. that way. Okay, cool. So so you're, you're, you're skipping the type checking, but I'm still curious how the, the transpilation to JS still performs better than just plain JS or, or is there just that minimal hit that first time and it's negligible enough or? Yeah, it, it doesn't perform better because if you do more work than like that's the CPU cycles you spend, right? Um, yeah. But it performs, it does not perform noticeably worse. It performs so quickly that it is like, especially with this caching, that it is mm -hmm. like imperceptible that it's TypeScript transpiling. Right. Yeah. And for there's optimized other optimizations we do, for example, if you're running your code for production, what you can do is beforehand, you can call Dino cache on your source okay. code or just execute it once and it'll do all the transpiling and it'll cache all the transpiled source code. And then after that, it won't have to retranspile it. Okay. But like the, the difference here is like, we're speaking on the order of like, milliseconds like like hundreds okay, of, okay. of nanoseconds kind of thing it's like it's really nothing to be concerned about yeah okay gotcha superman or the flash might recognize it but <clears throat> as mere yeah. mortals probably not okay yeah. cool okay so that that's great so that's kind of sets up the stage for for fresh now so so fresh is a new web framework that you created and I, I've seen since then, obviously other folks have contributed to it cause it's open source. Um, I guess what, you know, for, for the people that'll probably groan and say not another JS web framework, uh, personally, I'm excited, but you know, <laughs> I guess what, what were the reasons for creating fresh instead of trying to have something else work on Dino? Yeah. So originally it was, we were trying to figure out what like good development flows that de that Dino developers, like good flows for Dino developers to do the stuff they want to do, namely write okay. websites. And this started out as sort of like a research project where we were trying to figure out like how simple can we make it to write projects in Dino? And like, how can we use all this tooling that's built into Dino to write like a framework, which is very little overhead and mm -hmm. is not very complicated itself. Like Fresh itself is actually really simple. You can read through the source code pretty easily if you have some understanding of TypeScript, some understanding of web servers. And yeah. it's really not that complicated because complicated things like file watching or dependency graphs, stuff like this is all something you don't have to care about at all because it's just all built into Dino. It's something okay. that like usually 
like uh, in node v would handle something like this and all of this is just built into dino so it's it's not something you need to deal with yourself then at some point we realized that actually this research project was really cool and it was very nice to use and we started using it for some of our internal project or some of our internal sites like dino.com or dino.land which yeah. both run on fresh now sort of over time that morphed into, okay, so this is actually really cool. How can we make this, how can we get this to a stage where it's like usable by anyone, like easy to set up? And that's the current incarnation of Fresh. Okay, cool, cool. And in terms of production apps using Fresh right now, like I know there was the Fresh 1.0 release pretty recently. I think, is it the doc site on DinoLand or the whole DinoLand site that's running on Fresh or? Okay. The entire thing, yeah. So Dino.land okay. is entirely run on, on, on Fresh. What else? Dino.com is run on Fresh. Lint.dino.com runs on Fresh. Examples.dino.com or Dino.land runs on Fresh. There's a bunch of them. Okay. My personal website runs on Fresh. There's some other ones outside of Dino that also run on Fresh. Like it, Fresh serves millions of requests every day successfully. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. We'll, we'll definitely we'll we'll definitely take a peek at some code soon. But I guess before we do that, like, what are some of the, I guess, like, what kind of high level? What's the architecture of Fresh, or or like, what what were some decisions you took, and and maybe why, if you want to speak to that. Yeah. So after it, after we realized that this research project is actually going to be six, like is is pretty useful, we tried to figure out like what is like originally we had approached this from the angle. Let's just take one of the existing frameworks and just try to clone as much of the functionality that it has, and not try to not think too much about architecture and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And when we started doing that, we realized that actually a bunch of this architecture that's currently out there in, in frameworks like React and, and or sorry, not React, and Next.js and Remix and frameworks like that okay. is really not that great. Um, it like is very bloated in some, in, in, in some sense that like when you have a blog, for example, that you mm -hmm. want to, like you have a blog, you need to, to serve your blog, you need to render like your markdown files into HTML, you just ship that HTML yep. to the client. And most of these frameworks support some form of server-side rendering, which is great. Like it makes for, yeah. for nice, fast loading speed. But they also then, after the client has loaded this, send the entire rendering infrastructure for this page to the client as well. Like they'll, they'll send the mark, they'll, they'll not just send the HTML, they'll also send the markdown and all the JavaScript that's required to render that HTML to okay. the client so it can re-render it there which is like, yeah. is that really necessary, right? Like what benefit does this provide? It opts you into a bunch of, sending a bunch of JavaScript to the client that you probably don't really want to be sending. So Dito tries to reverse, or Fresh, sorry, tries to reverse this by sending no JavaScript to the client by default. And you have to explicitly opt in if you want mm -hmm. certain components to be rendered on the client, which allows us to send a bunch of, a bunch of less JavaScript, which is great for performance and your okay. user's battery life and stuff like that. Yeah, and the, and what you're referring to there is uh, I'm familiar with this because I've used this where it used to work. That's a uh, Jason Miller's doc Island article about Islands architecture. I think this makes sense, and it's kind of funny because I mean I've been doing web dev for a while now, and it's like web dev started off with server side rendering everything, and then it's like 2005 Ajax came on the scene, uh, which makes no sense now because we don't ship XML, but Jason over the pipe, but. But it was, it was funny how like, we're like, okay, the page is slow. And I, I think a lot of it tied into maybe even broadband speeds weren't that great at the time. There's, a, I think a few things, but, but sure. it's kind of, you know, progressively ironically, cause that's a term, a web term, but like things seem to get heavier and heavier and we ended up with like a fat client and then you, we ended up with the spa and then you're slowly seeing things kind of coming full circle to server side rendering is great again, or, or, or in a lot of contexts, it can be great. You know, there, yeah. there's definitely reasons for different kinds of architectures, like, like a spa can make sense in certain scenarios still, mm -hmm. but so it, it is kind of interesting how, uh, you know, it's like server side rendering isn't new, but it, it's kind of almost, I feel like it's almost being kind of, you there's know, like a showcased for, as it's it's for... new, it's new. There's this thing. Yeah, it's yeah. a server. <laughs> yeah, I, so I think there's uh, some yeah. some like market like some innovations in the industry that have really made this uh, work. One of them being edge infrastructure, like being able to yeah. server side render close to your users, is something ten years ago like you could do it if you were Google, but like 
they're not Google, then it's like a quite the pain to do, you know, <laughs> like you have yeah, your one sure. thing hosted out of, out of, well, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably your own data center somewhere on the U S East coast. And then like, if you're in Asia, then well, good luck to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think the the thing is really, we went from this, like one extreme where there's no sta- no client side, anything at all, like purely server side rendered to the other extreme yeah. where there's like, we send an empty HTML page to the client and render everything on the client. That's yeah, like yeah. the APA thing. And we're now sort of like, you can sort of think of it as like a, what do you call them? A pendulum. Like it, yeah. it goes from one side to the other and we're sort of swinging back now and it's going to like stabilize somewhere across the middle at some point where we'll have like yeah, the, sure. the perfect balance of server side rendering and client side rendering. Yeah, no, And totally. I think this balance yeah, really like also depends on what you're building. Like some projects it's yeah, for sure. Much different balance. Cause, yeah. Cause like I, I worked in FinTech at one point and I mean, there's no way you're going to server side render every split second. You like, that's something that's coming with web sockets through the yeah. pipe and there was like observables and it, it's clearly client heavy because of the mm-hmm. nature of what it does. But, but that's really more like an application, you know? And like, but yeah, if you're doing, if you're doing stuff like, cause like, the funny thing is at the end of the day, the web pages are really just forms. You're, you're submitting stuff. Like regardless of what you say, this is my new app. You're there, at some point there's a form, something's going to be submitted, you know, and data is going to be transmitted. So it's like, yeah, yeah no, there's, it, it definitely depends what you're doing for sure. But like, in a I lot think of cases, you're Figma and like you, yeah. you build like a, like a Photoshop in the browser or illustrator in the browser. You don't have like that's completely fine to client side render, right? Like that makes complete yeah. sense. But if your blog does not need to be client side rendered, like Yeah, exactly. And then like and then yeah, there's that middle ground too, or like instead of having the empty index HTML that you hydrate with your full component tree, you know, it probably it probably makes sense whether they're already pre statically generated or you server render the first time and then it's cached, but then then you do those pockets of interactivity, the, the islands architecture, which I referenced there. And yeah. I, I think it makes sense because most pages, your, your whole page isn't truly interactive, you know, like you're, you're going to click on a button that might, you know, f- perform some validation, you know, like the rest of the page, it, the markup probably isn't going to alter really that much. So, uh, yeah. yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right, so I, I think we set the stage pretty well for taking a peek at Fresh. So I'm just going to switch us to coding view here. So oh, yeah, you can still see my screen over there. So just one sec. And my, of course, because we're doing it live, my shortcut's not working, but that's all good. Yeah, so we're going to just take a peek in VS Code. And I guess like the first question I'd have is like, you know, um, how do we get started with Fresh? Uh, aside from the, I'll, I'll say the obvious, make sure you have Dino installed. I'll drop a link yeah. to Dino again. So you definitely need the latest. I can't remember when I when I tried it out the other day because I had Dino installed previously and it said I need, I forget what version it said Fresh needed. One, 123.0, I, I think you need. Okay. So that's so, like from two weeks ago. So I guess if we we're going to get started, what's the first thing we do? So I've got Dino installed now. I'm at my terminal. What's the next steps? I think next step is actually counterintuitively to leave the terminal and go to your extensions pane <laughs> on your editor and install the Dino extension. Cause I think this is actually a thing that a lot of people miss and then they get confused why they why everything's broken. I'll drop a link to it again. I think I dropped it before, but um, yeah. So, okay. So we, and, and so for folks who might not have used the extension, what does the extension provide you? The extension provides you an integration of Dino, like the CLI tool into your editor. It, provides okay. things like type checking right while you're writing code, formatting, linting, testing, all this kind of stuff built right into the editor. And like you can interact with Dino through the editor view of your code rather than having to manually invoke things in the CLI. Okay, cool. Yeah. I just got the the command palette open here and just looking at yeah. all of them there. So okay. So for most projects, what you'd do next is you would open the command palette and type in this Dino initialize workspace configuration and it'll then set up a folder in your current directory to like do this. But for fresh, because many people forget about this, it'll actually do that automatically when you're trying to initialize a fresh project. So the next thing you do now is you go to the fresh home page and copy the init command. So the home page that's fresh.dino.dev. Okay. Let me just drag that over here. Okay. There we go. Uh, okay, fresh.dino.dev. 
Okay, I, I love this this page, the, the dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I we have this now. really awesome um, like animator and, and graphic design person Hashrock on our team. He's he does this. Okay. It's magic. <laughs> Cool, cool. So I guess I'm going to grab this here because the assumption yep. is I have Dino installed at this point. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's come here. Let's run that. I'll just make this a bit bigger so folks can see what's going on. So I see it pulling down a lot of TypeScript files. And then now it's, uh, I must have had another project there. Hold on. Okay. Let's try that again. Let's hope there's nothing important in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, thank, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you in a couple hours. Okay, so <laughs> so it's it's pulling down all this TypeScript. Now it's asking me, do I want to install Twind, which I'm new to this, but it's Tailwind, but it's like it compiles on the fly. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. It's Tailwind okay. without the without the like extra compiled stuff. It's like server side um, rendering for Tailwind essentially. Okay, got you. So should I I should just say yes for now? I guess. Or? Yeah, let's just let's do it. It's gonna be nice right. to make it look good. And there you get okay, the question, do you nice. use VS Code? Yes, okay. Okay, cool. So that's created that. I'm just gonna open it up now. Let's call my project. All right, so, okay. So we've got it all open here now. So it's scaffolded us a project here. So I guess the first thing I see is the, the VS Code folder for the settings. I guess the, the super important part to make sure the Dino integration works well with the extension. We're actually going to, at some point in the future here, let you not have that. And if you, if there's a Dino JSON file in the root of your repository, it'll just enable the extension automatically, but I haven't gotten okay. to it yet. I have to specify okay. this for now. Yeah. Okay. And then extensions, just the Dino land, which I already have. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, what, what files should we take a peek at now? Or do you want to talk about the folder structure or? Maybe we can start, let's start with just actually running the project, like starting, okay. starting the local server, and then we can run yeah. through what it's doing. So I need to run Dino task start. And, and Dino task is like a built-in task runner for Dino, which is sort of similar to NPM's scripts syntax. Okay. You define it in your Dino JSON file. It's a completely opt-in. Like if you don't have a Dino JSON file, that's fine. You don't need it for fresh projects you know. do, but for, if you're doing other things. And and yeah, so we'll start this and I, and I see there's the import map, which you were talking about before too. And this is, even though I'm still kind of new to it, I know that the import map is because there's no node module. So these are actually URLs to the actual packages or not packages, but code that you would. Exactly. It's like the import map essentially allows you to uh, specify shorthand. It's like a, a, a URL redirect, like a local URL redirect service, essentially, that allows you to okay. expand short URLs into longer URLs. And this kind of reminds me of like, because I've, I've had to configure Webpack quite a bit in a lot of projects over time. And I know other bundlers do this too, but this kind of reminds me of aliases that you can use in like Webpack or whatever. And I imagine this is actually nice too, because if ever you like say fresh gets upgraded to 1.0.2, I just need to come in here and I never even have to touch my code. The most important thing to understand is that ultimately these are just redirects. So like in the code, anywhere where you would see like dollar sign fresh slash, you yeah. can just replace that with like the HTTPS Dino land X fresh at 1.1. It'll work the exact same way. These are just like redirects to make it easier okay. to type. Gotcha. Okay, so let's go take a peek in the browser here. All right, so uh, localhost, you said. So, okay, so oh, let me zoom this in a bit just for folks. Okay, so uh, don't worry about the styling for now, but so we've, we've got the, the famous lemon logo, which I love. Uh, it looks like we have a counter here, kind of like a, a typical thing that you'll see in a lot of demos when they're starting off with like a, a new framework. So I imagine yeah. I can just go plus plus minus minus okay cool yeah all right so that loaded up and it this is coming from the route slash index.tsx like it says yeah okay. exactly the way fresh works is that it server side renders all of your html or so you so what fresh really is is the templating and routing framework this is what it is internally like you it has a way for you to very expressively specify what routes map to what things you want to render on the client. Essentially, there's an evolved way of saying you create a file with a given name and whatever's in that file will be executed for that request. Gotcha. The client will be served that. In this case, have this routes folder and the routes folder is like 
the folder structure that configures the router. And the file name is mapped to the, the path that you have to put into your browser to, to execute that file. So index.tsx is like your index page, right? The index is like a yeah. special name. If you don't specify anything, it'll use the index one, like the okay. index uh, thing. And, and like there's an API folder in there. So requests that start with slash API will go into the API folder. And if it happens to be slash API slash joke, it'll use the joke.ts file. And this name one, that's a dynamic route. So anything that doesn't match, like anything, uh, if you do path slash, or if you do, sorry, uh, localhost 8080 slash foo, um, that'll be yeah. matched by this like dynamic matcher. So it says hello foo. Yeah. yeah. And this is, uh, I, I've definitely, this is in Next.js. I think Remix does this too now. It's all pretty I'm similar sure to like how, how Remix Next do it. And like you said, uh, just for fun here, we'll just go to slash API slash joke, I guess. Google knows what I'm doing. So if I refresh, it's just loading a random element from the array. I think that's a pretty straightforward routing story. Okay, so that makes sense. I'm curious about this islands folder. And that's, that's the counter component that we were talking about. But you were saying in terms of fresh, so it's out of the box, or, or maybe you said this, or maybe I read it, but out of the box, it ships Node.js. So I'm guessing just based on the name of that islands folder, that that means whatever's in here will get served up in an interactive way somehow. Yes, exactly. So by default, everything is server side rendered and only components that are in the islands folder get hydrated on the client. But if cool, you like cool. open the page source view for this, you'll see that everything is server side rendered. View page source for folks who might not use that anymore. It, it still exists. We've got the like somewhat oh, compressed yeah, uh, market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, not very readable because uh, there's no line breaks, but th this yeah. is the static HTML render of the page. And there's this little bit of JavaScript at the bottom that configures the page to hydrate the counter. So this like client element okay. that you put in the islands folder that's hydrated on the client using, using this little bit of script. But it's nice to see here. So you're not even bothering with old ways. You're just sticking to new browser imports here right away. So, IE 11's uh, dead now, right? Everything supports I mean, modules. And the revive, like you said, so that's the hydration. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious what the hydration story is. You're passing the name of the component here, the counter, and then you're saying revive a counter. So does it yeah. just look for all instances of counter? Because I don't see like a CSS selector for like an ID or a data <laughs> attribute or something. Yeah. So actually, maybe what's easiest, if you copy the source code and just paste it into an HTML file in the editor, um, you can like format it and then we can inspect the output a little. I'm just going to paste this in here and I'll just save it in HTML. Let's just save it to desktop so it doesn't mess up our structure here. Okay. And I think that formatted. Ah, there we go. Um, Fantastic. So this is the important part here and I'll just wrap it. So there, there's a little bit of JS at the bottom. And the important thing here are these HTML comments in the yeah. source code that you see on line 119 or 319 and 324. They okay. essentially tell Fresh that there's a, a component in between these comments that it needs to hydrate. So what the revive function does, it walks through the DOM tree, looks for these comments, um, and then maps yeah. the name in the comment to the component that you pass like through this options bag and revive. And this is all handled in internally in the framework. Like this is not something you need to deal with yourself. So it's all auto-generated, so, okay. Yeah, exactly. So... And what you can actually also see is that there's that like zero at the end of the counter component. This means it's the first, like we start counting at zero, right? So it's the first island. And we have okay. this other script tag on line 326, which yeah. are the props that you had originally passed to that island. Oh, so okay. the first nice. one of those is, if you go back to the source code, you'll see that we pass uh, start equals three Good, in the sorry. index route. Yeah, okay, down here. Yeah. So you pass start equals three, and we uh, take those props and store them in this script tag so we can revive them on the clients as well. So you have this like continuity between server and client. Okay. And yeah, no, this is not, this, this kind of reminds me for anybody that's done Redux, you'll, you'll have like this little Redux kind of snippet of, of state that gets passed in. It kind of reminds me of that it's not the exact same thing, but okay. So, so that's good. So that gives, that's our initial prop for that. And then we've got the code that runs and then counter counter. And so like you said, like if I put two counters in here, the next 
commented one would be counter one. So I would get two islands of fresh island props then? So the, the fresh island props would, it's an array, right? There would be two elements in that Oh, array. yeah, yeah. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. And this is also kind of nice because like, I know like hydration is definitely a, a popular topic right now. I know there's some issues in some cases, like I, I've seen this and it, it's, it's not to knock a framework or anything, but like I know there's an issue right now with like, react server components when you do the hydration say you have i don't know like browser extensions that modify the markup you'll get the proper server side rendered markup coming in but then before react does the hydration extensions will modify it and then you'll get this like yeah. oops no i'm not right so uh, this kind of pattern completely removes any kind of issue like that right yeah Exactly. Yeah. This is the first code on the page that runs essentially. The only way this would break is if you would have some sort of extension, which like strips out HTML comments from the HTML as it's being sent on the client, which is, it, don't like quote me on this, but I'm like 98% <laughs> sure that extension does not exist. <laughs> gotcha. There's very little reason for this to break. Um, yeah. Okay. This completely makes sense. I mean, obviously this is a fairly unique ID. I mean, it's, it's very unlikely somebody's going to create a, a script. Well, well, I, the only time I see IDs on scripts are when people are manipulating them. Uh, otherwise you're just typically just loading them. No, that's cool. And so I guess the revive itself, it's probably not doing too much, right? Like it's, it's saying revive the counter. It checks the yeah. item props. It, it's actually really then... simple. If you want to just look at the source code for it, it's pretty easy to understand, I think. If you go yeah. to the fresh repo, github.com slash dinoland slash fresh. I'll just go here and then go to GitHub. Is it? Yeah, that works too. There. I'm being lazy. And then you so, want to go to source runtime main.ts. Okay. I think is what it's called. Oh, weird. Fresh main. Or maybe it's not called main.ts. Main. I think it's called main.ts. Let me check real quick. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. Doo -doo. Fresh. Okay. Source runtime main.ts. Oh, there I see it. You got it, it popped up. I don't know okay. why it didn't. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Let me just zoom that in a bit. Yeah, so the, this has a revive function in here somewhere. Here it is. Okay. It has this walk function. What exactly this does, it's not important that we understand exactly what the code does, but essentially what it does is it walks through all the DOM nodes. Like it, the DOM is a recursive yeah. data or a, a data structure that starts at the top, like is recursive. We walk through the entire DOM node or all the DOM nodes and we like look for comments that match like a regex where it starts with fresh. That's the like no, no type, type eight. Type that's eight a comment. Is... Yeah. It's a comment. So we look okay. for comments that look like that. We then go look for the end node. We collect all the nodes that are in between the start and the end comment, and then we just okay. call preact's render method okay. to render. And that's a that's something we didn't talk about yet. It's using preact instead of react. I'm a big fan yeah. of preact. I used it where I used to work. I'm gonna guess a couple reasons why you're probably using it. One, it's definitely it's smaller than React for one thing. As far as I know, because like I, I I've seen because I follow Jason Miller on. Twitter and I think he I think he tweeted out at one point like you can fit all of Preact in like one screenshot and I don't think there's any dependencies is that right That's right and so I guess that makes it because just getting back to Dino so like right now there's some like there's definitely stuff being served as ES modules like via Skypack or ESM.sh or other mm -hmm. CDNs that are able to convert them to Earl based imports but there's still a lot of Node stuff that you at least right now you can't because people have imported things. So there's stuff that you might not be able to use in a Dino environment yet. Is that correct? Yeah. So with Dino, you need to use ES modules. You cannot use require and a bunch yeah. of node source code is still written using require. So anything that uses require needs some sort of transpilation step to run in Dino. And like this ESM.sh, for example, does a really great job of being able to do this transpilation, but the yeah. transpilation comes at the cost of a complexity, right? And B, mm -hmm. it might change the source code in such a way that it becomes larger or that it doesn't okay. work exactly, like it doesn't execute in exactly the same order that the required code would. So yeah. there's like, ideally you want to use ESM first modules and preact is ESM first, which is great. I was a big fan of it too. Well, I, I used to work at dev too, uh, which is a c mm -hmm. programming community. And like, we're very, when I was working there, it's like, performance was a big thing. So like the, the site is, it's a Rails app, but it's like heavily cached server side. And then this is, you know, 
it, that's where the islands of interactivity come in. You know, it, it we weren't using a framework. It was really more bespoke. So mm -hmm. It's really just like, you know, just kind of classical, you know, like go find an element by a selector or like a, maybe a data attribute and then just bootstrap Preact render there and then just yeah. let it take over from there. Preact yeah. has been able to have like multiple routes on the same page for like forever. Like React only recently introduced this. I don't know if it's like React 17 or React 18 where you can have multiple routes on the, on the same page. So yeah. that's really nice. And, and the other thing that Preact does, it provides a lot more customizability into like how it functions it, it gives you a bunch of hooks where you can like hook into the rendering pipeline to to do things like yeah. one thing we need to do for example is during the server side render we need to figure mm -hmm. out what components you're actually like what island components you're actually using so we can extract like the yep. props out of them to be able to serve them and to like even just serve the right code to every page to figure out what to hydrate okay. we, we can use that using these like hooks that that Preact provides yeah, no, and it's it's nice too because like uh, obviously the React ecosystem has a lot of components out there, and like Preact has the Preact Compat, so we were able to leverage that too. And it's yep. it's pretty small small layer for that. I'm curious too because I I can't remember because I never really used Preact for server side rendering because it was primarily a Rails app, and I, I was I was doing what I call fake server hydration. So I would basically whatever the Rails app generated, I would make sure that. It was, you know, because because you can end up yeah, a problem with the VDOM yeah. diff, and like uh -huh. I remember for for folks who've ever done this, like what happens is like if the markup is slightly different that that comes from the server side or the component, you end up with two components like where it goes to mount because it goes ah I try I, I was I try to do as good a job at VDOM diffing and it looks like it's not really so you're gonna get both it was it was quick to fix but it, it was it, the first time you see it you're like what's going on there but, it's really um, nice if you're using like the same component system on both client and server you don't need to deal with stuff like this because it's just like automatically in sync right yeah exactly and and the, the thing i was going to ask because because i haven't used it for server side rendering is does preact just offer the two string right now or do they have a, sh a streaming api for that i can't remember so I'm actually not sure either. We use the I, like Fresh uses the two string because the streaming one, like if you're not using suspense, the overhead yeah. is, is there's much more overhead with the streaming one. Like if you're doing synchronous yeah. rendering, rendering takes like milliseconds, right? There's yeah. no point in streaming out like a hundred kilobytes of HTML versus buffering it into a string and then sending it all at once. Yeah. And most of the stuff's going to get cached anyways. It's like, yeah. non-interactive parts so i don't know if you want to touch on t win at all like I, the, the reason why i'm talking about it is because like mm -hmm. i i know you hit the 1.0 but the like the styling story isn't completely defined yet like i know i've, yeah. I've been checking out the repo a bit and i mean i don't think this is a bad thing it's just like it's still early days right you know you're still exploring a bit i think but like yeah. t win makes sense because a lot of folks are using tailwind but can you like right now, can I somehow include just a plain CSS tag, you know, like adding a, a link yep. href? Uh, okay. So. so Fresh has a static <laughs> folder that you can just put anything yeah. you want into and it'll serve that. And then you can have like a head tag anywhere in your tree with like a link in it and you can import that CSS. So that okay. works, but it's like, it's not quite as nice as I want it to be yet. If you open the main.ts yeah. file right now, for example, in the project, there's a lot of boilerplate in there to set up Twin. Like that's 20 lines of boilerplate okay, to set yeah, up yeah. Twin. I don't want to have 20 lines of boilerplate in there. Yeah. There's a bunch of, like th this Tailwind, this like it asks you if you want to use Tailwind during the thing because there were so many people who like asked me to, before the, the launch, how yeah. to do styling. And this is like the quick hacky way of doing it, right? Because we couldn't quite yeah, get yeah. styling in for 1.0. So... We're going to have a nice way of doing this in 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2. Okay, cool. And I'm sure the community is going to find some interesting solutions to or, or like, you know, riff on existing stuff. I mean, Tail Tailwind yeah. is, is super popular, but I'm thinking about other stuff too, because like, like one of the things that the framework touts is there's no bundle step, which I think mm -hmm. is great. For somebody who's been working on other web dev projects, they're probably used to the bundling step with whether it's Vite, Webpack, or or whatever they're using, even if it's you know, hidden from them. For other tooling, like so, like like Twin, for example, it's it's the runtime version of Tailwind because Tailwind itself needs to use Post CSS, do a bundle step, check, you know, like do I need to purge things yeah. and so on. So so I, I totally get why you're going with the Twin, but I wonder if if like you maybe see 
like the framework still just being bundle free, but like there's nothing stopping me from committing a bundle step, which generates the CSS that I'll serve or something. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. yeah that's totally something which, which I'd, I'd be open to. I think there's a bunch of ways to do CSS, right? Like you could use, there's people who've asked about using SAS and the SAS compiler, which is a, like, that's a build step, but yeah. like you could, for example, consider checking in your uh, output file from the SAS compiler. Uh, it's like, it's just CSS. Yeah. And then yeah. you don't need a build step anymore unless you're actually changing the file, which most people yeah. will probably not be changing the file, but they'll be changing logic, right? So yeah, there's a bunch of different styling frameworks that I want to in investigate, but it's just, I haven't had time to like dig through all of them yet. <laughs> For sure. And I, and I, I'm definitely no pressure. It's a, I think it's just great to get something out there. It, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's definitely great seeing it. Ryan's asking in the chat, we talked about this at the beginning, but can you just kind of touch on, like, you talked about it at the beginning, but like, how yeah. does the client JavaScript get served if they're serving, if we're writing code in TypeScript? Ryan mm -hmm. was just wondering. We touched upon this right in the beginning is that we can mm -hmm. use like really fast transpilers to strip out the types from the TypeScript. So essentially browsers don't understand TypeScript, but they understand JavaScript and TypeScript. Yeah. And Dino only supports the superset of TypeScript, which is purely type strippable. So it does it has no type directed emits. Don't worry about this if you don't understand what it means for people who are watching. It's like, <laughs> essentially it means TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript where if you just go through the source code and like select all the types and strip them out, the source code will work exactly the same way. So gotcha. that's essentially what we do on the fly when the user requests the thing. And then we do the same thing that Dino does, which is cache the output. And this is yeah. actually very similar to what you would do, for example, with, uh, let's say like images, right? Where you have your, your mm -hmm. source images might be like WebP images, but yeah. for older browsers on the fly, you'll transpile them to JPEGs or to PNGs or to, okay, I don't yeah. know, whatever other format the browser does support. Yeah. And so, this also yeah, gives us, there's an open PR on the Fresh repo, which allows us to use the same infrastructure where we can transpile stuff on the fly in to like to dynamically serve different but or not different bundles different code to okay. different browsers uh, so browsers which support more modern features can have those modern features and the ones that don't yeah. support them there'll be a transpiled version of them okay yeah um there's a i'll just answer one other thing so they're talking about jsx and so if, you, if you've never used typescript typescript can transform jsx on the fly too you can choose like whether it's the react or preact version like using h for vdom or whatever so just like the typescript being transpiled to js the same thing would happen with the jsx um right okay and there was a question from h dodov how does Dino handle peer dependencies? That's <laughs> a very complicated question. <laughs> so it handles the, the, the easy way of getting myself out of answering this question is by saying it handles peer dependencies <laughs> the same way that the browser does, which is if there's two URLs, which are the same URL, it'll not execute that URL multiple times. The complicated answer to this is that uh, this really depends on your project, how you set up your P dependencies. One thing you can do is use import maps to remap a bunch of different specifiers to all point to the same module. So if you yeah. import Preact in a bunch of different places from a bunch of different URLs, you can all map them to map down back to the same Preact version, for example, which means okay, there will yeah. only be a single version of Preact. But there's no like automatic deduplication of dependencies or anything like that because Dino is not aware of the concept of packages or versions of modules. Modules for Dino are a URL and yeah. whatever is behind that URL is what Dino sees and that's how it deduplicates. Like there's no deduplication based on package name or version or anything like that. Yeah. If we go back to the import map, you could always just say like everything's just going to use this particular version and map it in the import map. I guess you might yeah. not be able to do that if... Well, I guess it depends if it's all the code you own, you can do that. But if it's like you're importing somebody else's, you might not be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how deep we want to go into this, but I, there's, there's another project that we're working on right now. I don't know if we're working on it right now, but we're, which we are planning to work on soon at least, which yeah. will do this deduplication automatically. It'll like go through your module graph and okay. figure out, like parse out the URLs and see if they're like the same package at different versions and it'll generate an import map. Uh, which does this oh, deduplication. Cool. Is there a project folks can look at or is this just kind of like internal? Uh, there's like a very 
work in progress thing. Let me post it in chat here. I, I hope it's open source. If not, you're going to see a dead link here in a second. <laughs> you, you, you might no, see the Obi, Obi-Wan Twitch. Kenobi. Uh, I, I'm not uh, signed into Twitch. Uh, it's github.com slash kitson k um, slash pin. Let me actually sign okay. into Twitch one second. Yeah, yeah, cool. No worries. Uh, cool, cool. Feel free to yeah. continue asking a question while I'm signing in. Yeah, I'm just seeing if there's uh, some other questions that I missed in the okay. chat here. Some folks are talking about, there's there's some folks that might, I think, I'm pretty sure it's my coworker, Ryan Solid. He's the creator of SolidJS. So uh, and mm -hmm. people are asking about potentially integrating SolidJS. I imagine it would be doable, but I, I don't know the effort. The hydration stories, it already has its own hydration story. So I don't know how that would play yeah. with... Uh, so I, I we don't should have an chat for that, um, Ryan. If you're listening, we should. Yeah, yeah. Chat. Um, I, I, I can definitely. I've gotten this question a lot, and I think yes, it's definitely possible. There's some hooks that Solid needs to provide to be able to okay. do this properly, but I think we can totally work that out. There's, it's, yeah. There's some questions. I'm sure we can figure out if people want it. Cool, cool. He says, cool. All right, that's dope. All right bringing people together here. That's what we do. Um, awesome. OSS for the win. So I guess we, we kind of touched a lot of the stuff here and I'm really glad we dug into some of the Dino stuff. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Kits and pin. I'll, uh, I'll open that for a sec just to. It's like very bare bones. I don't even know. Uh, right now, but yeah, I'll, it's give, I'll give it a star to follow up. At. Cool. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I can see this becoming super important long term. So it's, it's it's definitely great that you're already looking into this. And I'm assuming yeah. Kitson is one of your coworkers, or yeah, he is. He yeah. works on a bunch of awesome stuff. Okay. Speaking of the team, I'm kind of curious. Like, how large is the the Dino team? I mean, I know it's OSS, so there's there's obviously mm -hmm. folks contributing f from all around the world. But the the core team itself is it a, is it a pretty lean team or? Yeah, so engineering wise, we have like, oh boy, I want to say, I don't want to forget anyone. I think we're like 15 or so right now, okay. engineering wise, working on Dino. But that's not just Dino, that's also the the product. Okay. Um, like so it's, it's about like, point, so. you, you could probably, it's probably like seven or eight full time on the CLI. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm wondering, is there is there anything we missed in here? I mean, we've touched on the island, so we know. So, like, clearly. Oh, I know. There's one thing I wanted to look at. I noticed in the fresh gen here. If you want to speak yes. about this for a few minutes. So I noticed this because I, I I created a sample app quickly yesterday, uh, or a couple days ago, and I noticed. So like, uh, I'm just gonna do it here now live, so people see mm -hmm. it. So I'm gonna just say like about dot tsx. And then whatever, I'll just do close uh, the file. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't even need to say. Oh, right. Oh, you there. switched to yeah. Right, right. Yes. So if I come back to uh, fresh gen, all of a sudden uh, I've got this new entry here that got auto generated. So I, I so I guess my, <laughs> I guess my understanding here is because there's no build step when it comes to shipping the code, it, yes. it's kind of like. We're, 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 we're kind of flipping things a little bit. We're, we're committing build artifacts to some degree to the code base to avoid that. Stretching the definition of a build step. So what this is, is it's working around a limitation of Dino deploy actually, where in Dino okay. deploy, you cannot dynamically import files yeah. because you cannot dynamically import files. This is essentially a manifest, which like does static mapping. It's like, it's the, the, the like poor man's dynamic import. Instead of dynamic import, you go to the manifest and pull the stuff out of there. This is automatically created by this dev.ts file, which is like what you use during okay. client development. This is something which is like very terrible and I will get rid of it, but <laughs> there's just a tad bit more work we need to do in, in Dino deploy to be able to support dynamic imports. Okay. So yeah, soon I, it'll be gone. I guess like, is the reason why dynamic imports aren't supported at the moment for security issues, like just importing rogue code or is it something else? Well, it's, it's a multitude of factors. One of them is security, but security is fixable. Like security, we can deal with that. The main issue is that when you dynamically import something, how do we know that the dynamic, like, so you dynamically import something. We don't want to have yeah. to pull down your dependence, like remote dependencies for that dynamic import at the edge okay. every time you dynamic import, right? So what we need to yeah. do is we need to pull down all of your dependencies up front when you're deploying okay. to be able to like provide a fast experience everywhere. To be able to do that, we need to know what dependencies we actually need to pull down. So 
how do we do that? That's that's the question. We essentially okay. need to find a way to pull down all the right remote dependencies at deploy time. There's ways we can do it, but it's it's just slightly involved and has taken longer than we had expected. But it'll happen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I get you. You, you kind of want to you want to cash it, uh, grab it once and cash it somehow. Yeah. That makes complete sense and I mean the I mean the fact that you have that fresh gen right now, I honestly I don't think that's really a showstopper. Yeah. It's something I, I, I think gonna, it's like no, I was just going to say it's not a showstopper. Like it, it yeah. will disappear at some point. So yeah, it's like a, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but yeah, there's worse. It's yeah. like, and the thing is it only actually regenerates when you change the file system. So it, it, it's not like a build step where like every time you make a code change, it creates some build artifacts. So it only creates this build artifact, build artifact, like very quotation mark build artifact when like you change the file system. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that's cool. Uh, I guess we're, we're getting close to time here, but is there, Hope is there what? anything we might have, uh, well, not, no, I mean, I could chat forever. It's not that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, so surprised. I thought it was like, yeah, no, <laughs> no way. When it's so a good quickly. conversation. Yeah. You, you don't realize what time it is, but is there, is there parts of fresh that we, like, I think we covered most of it or is there something else that like maybe we forgot to chat about, about fresh or. I mean, there might not be, but so it's, it's all, it's all cool. No, no pressure. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking right now. I think we've covered most of it. There's, there's, yeah, there's some like routing things we didn't cover. Fresh supports okay. middlewares is one okay. which allows you to like, oh, actually, I guess we didn't cover route handlers at all. Like how to do data fetching and stuff like that. So th these routes, they can do templating, right? Yeah. There's also, they're not just JSX templates, but like they can also just process requests and return responses, like raw responses, which is what okay. happens with this API route, for example. But there's yeah. docs on all of this if you want to learn more about it. Yeah, I'm going to drop a link to the docs there. I've just got the page up here for fetching data. Okay, so I'm just going to look at this quickly here. But okay, so you've got a handler. And is this kind of like, okay, wait. That's that's the handler, and then we're getting the props. So is this kind of like get static props injecting into a page here, like in Next.js? Is mm, that what's yeah, it's going something on? like that. Yeah. It's it's not quite get static props because it executes on every request rather than once. I, I don't remember how okay. get static props work, but yeah. It, so it's essentially it takes in a request object and returns a response object, and okay. you happen to be able to call this context .render function, which that will then render your template, which is in the same file. Um, oh, okay, and you can gotcha, pass gotcha. data so, to that, and that data will be passed as a prop to the page. Okay, and so this is what allows you to to do the render. Okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's cool. And uh, yeah, so there's async get here. Uh, it's not in the doc here, but I imagine you can do an async post as well. Yeah, I think in the next the the next page is form submissions. Okay. Oh yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to dive in too much, but uh, I'll definitely drop a link to just the fetching data into the chat here. Folks, check that out. Um, of course, my copy paste is not working. What's going on? All right, I'll have to go old school and right click. I don't know what's going on. My Maybe my keyboard <laughs> died at the end of the stream. Who knows? Oh no. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is really cool. I'm definitely gonna mess around with it a bit more. Because we use Dino for edge functions at Netlify, I got it working in the edge functions locally. I try to deploy, there's there's some things that I, I need to talk to some folks about, but it's, it's pretty nice, you know, and this isn't so much a fresh thing, but for, for folks that like, if you wanna end up debugging these things server side, because it's still using V8, you can still use the same debugging tool. So like, if you wanna open up the node debugger in like a Chromium based browser or your favorite editor, like a VS code yeah. or whatever that supports it. So uh, it's pretty neat. And it, from what I saw, it supports pretty much the same things like the dash dash inspect and dash dash inspect dash BRK, which which, you know, it's kind of nice to keep it uh, similar. Yeah, like for, for things where like there was obvious node equivalents yeah. on CLI flag, we just kept them the same because people are already familiar. I think what's the point of reinventing the wheel there? I guess aside from that, is there, you know, like the 1.0 has gone out, so you're definitely working on styling solutions at some point. Any other big kind of things you, you're looking into right now in regards to Fresh or? Yeah, so one other thing that we're working on is making it easy to do data fetching from islands, client side, like be able to talk to the server 
from the client in islands because right now you need to like create a separate uh, API route, stuff like that. There's going to be a much nicer way of doing that, which is like going to support streaming and all that kind of cool stuff. It's not quite ready though, okay. but keep an eye yeah, on no, the that... Dino blog. Honestly, this is just a lot of cool stuff. I, I, I know some folks get like JavaScript framework fatigue, but uh, I'm pretty excited about this. It's, it's nice seeing frameworks learn from other frameworks or, you know, get inspired by other frameworks, you know, yeah. it, it's, I guess it's a competition to some degree, but I, I just like how people are riffing off of other people and it's, it's really cool to see this. And I don't know, I'm pretty excited about Dino too. I'm going to dig more into that now. Um, so yeah, before we wrap things up, uh, I'm going to drop a link to your Twitter and I think your website's on there too. And yeah. if folks just want to check out the Dino site again, and I'll drop also the fresh site. Any Anything else you want to say before we say bye to all our lovely folks in the chat today? Nope. If you have any other, well, actually, yes. If you have any other questions, <laughs> then hop onto our Discord, discord.gg slash Dino. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this, this has been me. awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. So um, take care, folks. Next week, I'm going to be messing around with some view with my buddy Drew. That didn't rhyme on purpose. It just happened that way. Um, so yeah, check that out next week. And we got a bunch of other exciting folks uh, in July and August. So with that, I'll see you all next week.